I'm not generally a conspiracy theorist, but I want to raise a couple interesting coincidences involving the United States Department of Justice's filing in the Rahimi case, their last brief before oral argument in early November in the 922G8 case, which also happens to be on the exact same day that the main shooter went psychotic and engaged in that mass shooting. A shooting, by the way, they still, as of the filming of this video, have not found the shooter yet. Let's talk about these observations when we get back. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Box of Dine, a proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar, and author of Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. Also, a bunch of lessons that the Israelis should have learned when they left their citizens basically defenseless against the Hamas attacks. But that'll be a video on another day. Okay, folks, so on Wednesday of this week, we know that the United States Department of Justice filed their final reply brief in support of gutting the Second Amendment in the United States versus Rahimi case, which deals with the constitutionality of a Federal Gun Control Act, 18 U.S.C. 922 G8, that says that if you're a person subject to domestic violence restraining orders, you may not possess a gun. Now, what's interesting about the brief, which I'll cover in greater detail in a future video, on page 14 of the Department of Justice brief, this is one of the arguments they raise against the Second Amendment. They say that the reading of the Second Amendment by Mr. Rahimi, Rahimi's reading of the Second Amendment in stark contrast lacks meaningful limits. On his interpretation, legislators are powerless to disarm persons based on violent history, dangerousness, irresponsibility, or other character, character traits. But here's the key language, listen carefully. That interpretation would not only invalidate the statute at issue here, but also cast doubt on many other statutes, including, ready? including 18 U.S.C. 922-G4 dealing with persons who have been committed to mental institutions. Persons committed to mental institutions, people who have been involuntarily committed. That's true. Under 18 U.S.C. 922-G4, if you've been involuntarily committed to a mental institution, you may not possess a gun. You are a prohibited person, like a felon in possession. You can't do it under today's law. That's 18 U.S.C. 922 G4. So it's very interesting that on this exact same day that the Department of Justice is making this argument. Hours later, we find out that we have a United States Army reservist. And the Army's come out and said he's one of them. He's an Army party. He's an Army person. A U.S. Army reservist stationed in Maine engages in a mass shooting. As soon as this occurred, though, the Maine State Police issued a bulletin to all law enforcement, which I'm sure you've seen, that says that here's some background information about the, the alleged shooter, the people, the person of interest, that in addition to being a member of the U.S. Uh, Army Reservist, as in addition to being a U.S. Army Reservist, he was also in a mental health facility over the summer for several weeks. He also had hallucinations or other musings that he articulated out loud that he was interested in engaging in mass shootings, including shooting up his own military installation. So here's the question. How is it possible that the United States government and law enforcement knew that this individual was clearly so mentally ill and such a psychopath that he was put in a mental institution for several weeks over the summer of 2023 and then let go? So the question is, what happened here? Well, there's only one of two things that could have happened, both of which points to why we must have our own guns and we cannot trust government to protect us. The first thing that might have happened is that this shooter was indeed involuntarily committed to a mental, mental institution. If he were, in the summer 2023, involuntarily committed to a mental institution, then that would make him a prohibited person under 18 U.S.C. 922 G4, and thus he was not allowed to have the gun this week when he engaged in his mass shooting rampage. Which proves, of course, if this is all true, what I just said, that gun control laws do not stop criminals from doing criminal things. This is a lesson going all the way back to at least 1764. That's right, 1764. We've talked about that great Italian criminologist, Enlightenment philosopher, Cesar Vicaria, who wrote in 1764 that People that want to commit murder or other terrible crimes will not follow gun control laws. 
That was understood by our founding fathers before they adopted the Second Amendment, founding fathers including John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who were big fans of Cesar Picari and his work. So that's either scenario one, where this individual was committed to a mental health institution and voluntarily could not possess guns, but again, it demonstrates that this federal law that the Department of Justice is trying to defend in the Rahimi case is utterly meaningless, number one. Or the second alternative is in some ways even worse for the government, but either way, it shows that we cannot trust government to protect ourselves. The second scenario is that this individual, the shooter was indeed in a mental health, in, for, mental health institution for several weeks, over the summer, hallucinating that he was going to engage in mass shooting, and no one bothered to go out and get him involuntarily in, uh, civilly committed. Which begs the question of how, it, if that's the case, how is it possible that the United States Department of Justice, set aside even the main and other law enforcement authorities that may be out there, how is it possible that the United States Department of Justice with a 70, 70, $70 billion budget could not spare a few bucks to have a lawyer go up to Maine or draw, you know, hand, hang, 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 we head on over there and have a one-day hearing to get this guy civilly, you know, civilly committed to a mental health institution on the grounds that he's insane and dangerous. So if the government knew about this and yet they still did not actually go through the process of getting him civilly committed, thus making him a prohibited person under 18 U.S.C. 922 G4 for life, then what is the government thinking? What was the Department of Justice thinking? What were, the, what were the other government officials involved thinking by not having this guy declared mentally incapacitated, if you will? So either way, it demonstrates that you cannot trust government. Either they will try to enforce laws that are unenforceable against criminals, or they won't even bother to enforce the law, which gives rise to another interesting observation. I actually went out and I took a look at how many times in the history of America... I'm exaggerating a little bit, uh, in the last 10 years or so. Has the United States Department of Justice actually enforced the prohibited person law of dealing with people that have been involuntarily, mentally, involuntarily committed to mental health facilities? Well, despite the fact that in their submission this week where the United States Department of Justice is going like, oh, oh, do not support the Second Amendment. If you support the Second Amendment, you're going to prevent us from enforcing 18 U.S.C. 922 G4, dealing with persons who have been committed to mental institutions. Don't, don't, don't. It's a critical part of Merrick Garland's, milk toast Merrick Garland's ability to protect Americans' lives. Really? Okay. Well, that is the hyperbole we see on page 14 of their brief submitted to the United States Supreme Court in the U.S. versus the Rahimi case. But what is the reality? Well, it turns out, I've looked at the statistics, and I'll put a link to these down below, that between the year of our Lord, 2008 and 2012, how many people do you think were convicted of violating 922G4, meaning that you were mentally, involuntarily, you know, involuntarily committed to a mental health facility and subsequently caught possessing a firearm, which is a crime under that federal statute? 51 people between 2008 and 2012 in total. 51. And between 2013 and 2017, about 45. Which means, if you break it down, that the number of times the United States Department of Justice enforces 18 U.S.C. 922 G4 is somewhere between 6, 6, and 16 times a year. That is like less than... If you do the math, it's like non-existent. Six to 16 times a year, these law, this law is enforced. 18 U.S.C. 922 G4. And you have Merrick Garland here on page 14. Ooh! Help us! Don't protect the Second Amendment. We need this valuable, per important public safety tool in 18 U.S.C. 922 G4. The thing that we never actually use. And I think this highlights what happened in Maine. Because either the government knew this guy, they obviously knew he was a psycho because they knew he was in a mental health facility. So either they went about getting him involuntarily committed and he didn't follow the law because criminals don't follow the law when they want to commit murder, which means more gun control laws are utterly meaningless. 
or they couldn't be bothered to go through the process of getting this guy civilly committed to make him a prohibited person under 18 U.S.C. 922 G4. Either way, it shows that the ultimate fault here, in addition to, of course, the killer is ultimately to blame, but the related ancillary corollary concept here is that you cannot depend on the government to protect you. No matter how many laws they pass, they're simply not going to be followed by the criminals and they will only deter and hurt the law abiding from protecting themselves. And again, as I sit here today, it's been a couple days, they still haven't found this guy and who knows, he gets killed more. It's not like the government's going to find him, I'm guessing. Keep in mind, don't forget that in the, 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 the famous, infamous Boston Massacre uh, bombing aftermath where they made movies about the police, movies about Boston police and movies about, you know, the cops... I'm not, nothing against cops or police, by the way. They have a tough job and I'm on their side. Nevertheless, you make these movies about the heroic cops and whatnot. But it turns out that the person that found the second Mar Boston Marathon bomber was a guy who found the dude in his backyard hiding in a boat. In other words, another version of a modern-day militiaman, just an ordinary guy doing his duty, saw something weird in the backyard, went out to explore it and found the guy in his boat in his backyard, and then he called the cops, and then the cops found him. Woo, that was hard work. Get a phone call and say, hey, I think there's a, your bomber's in the backyard. Why don't you come drive over here and check it out? And they do. Okay, good for them. But again, it wasn't the police that found that second Boston bomber. It was an ordinary American. Never forget what the founding fathers understood. They were all part of the militia. We are a part of defending this country and ourselves. That is part of our job as Americans, and we must never, ever, ever surrender that authority and that right to the government because they're utterly, 99% of the time, not helpful, shall we say. And whether it be the Israeli government trying to protect the citizens in a Hamas attack or, America, or an American government agency trying to protect us from the main shooter or so on, guess what? Well, you can't rely on them. And the only other observation I want to make is I've talked several times on this channel, as have other gun tubers about the Nashville shooting manifesto. That Nashville shooter's manifesto remains sealed. We have not been able to see it. So I leave you with this question. If that manifesto had been revealed so that Americans, including those that live in the state of Maine, had had the opportunity to read it, to learn from it, to study it, is it possible, just possible, that someone in the state of Maine would have been able to identify and flag some sort of additional issue that may have saved lives with the benefit of that added information from, the dis from that information that is being hidden from us down there in Nashville. Now, of course, we don't know what would happen or what would not, whether it's true or not. It's only speculation. But again, more information is generally better than less information. And one wonders whether that added information that might have been available had the shooter's manifesto in Nashville been turned over to the public, whether or not that would have made a difference. We'll, we'll not know, will we? So, all right, folks, hope you learned a little bit something here today. Uh, interesting set of coincidences. I'll let you guys reflect further on what it might mean. And again, we will talk soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, at Four Boxes Diner. And we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up, table 2A.